program. Um, we have put some things in place for the mandatory promotion piece. That's one of the pieces that we've really taken a look at. And there is a process in place now that we've looked at that if a parent, if a student is a few points over, you know, and the parent still wants to retain them, we're thinking, you know, that might be a conversation that needs to be had in the building with the principal, the teacher, the parent. And if they can't come to a decision, then there needs to be a process at the district level that we can kind of mediate with that. So anyway, that's what we're asking, and we're not asking for a decision tonight. Are you asking for the pilot to be extended or for it to be part of our part of policy? What we do. We're asking for it to be part of policy. You know, I'm really glad you added that last part because the, the excitement is there for all of the strengths of the tool that this rubric provides with all this professional development and input to the teachers. And it, it has brought up in the past the question of what have we removed as far as discretion of the parent or discretion of the teacher and that local collaboration that knows the student. Uh, you know, quantifying, you know, suggest, uh, suggest or uh, subjective data rather than quantitative data is always tough. Sure. I mean, are, is the, all those things that you know and I don't know, but things like like uh, attitude and what's the home environment and and is the student socially ready or you know meets all of the score for mandatory promotion. That was sort of a surprise to me when we first started with this was, oh, okay, they meet this minimum score, so I'm sorry, I don't care what you say, parent, teacher, principal, team, the numbers say they have to go on. And I, I know that's not what we're about. And so uh, the message in past years was keep up the good work, keep working on it. It sounds like you've worked on it and even addressed that, that aspect of a way to or mediate or mitigate or come to a good decision using the data but also using those subjective things that always come into play. So that's encouraging. And like I said, you revisit this every year. We look at the process to see that it's working because it needs to work for kids. I can speak, speak personally to this one because it's happened in my school and this is the second year in a row. Uh, last year we had a student who uh, barely barely made the rubric score and teacher was in favor, I was in favor, and parent worked in favor of keeping the child back um, just for various reasons uh, not to discuss, but um, went on and we caught, we caught her then at the first grade level <coughs> and she kind of struggled through first grade and we felt like if this maybe would have been in place then we could have had kindergarten over again with the beginning basic skills and then maybe not so much of a struggle and, and a hardship on the student the, and, know, the and the classroom. And the classroom and the, uh-huh. And then I've got one this year that uh, we just met with the parent today and the child's sitting right there and they're like, oh no, please do not, please don't send her on. She's just turned five, you know, in August. And and so I think this is, in my role, this is huge for me with working with parents. and. right 
right into what Dr. Watson is saying about kindergarten readiness. We don't know what that's going to look like, but we're one step ahead in first and second grade readiness, so we've got to feel pretty good about that. I'd like to challenge the, the board that's sitting now to consider um, speaking on behalf of this program, because I really feel like you get a hold of something that can really change the lives of, of kiddos and to improve the educational process. I think it's our duty to share that. And the last time we did that was the Common Core. And it was a good activity for the board at the time to go through that process, to work together as a team. And I thought it was a good um, opportunity to, to share with other uh, people across the state what we've learned. And I think it's a good thing. So I'd like everybody kind of challenge everybody to consider doing that. When would we have to well, the KSB conference is in the, the first week of December. But the deadline to apply to, to uh, present is in July. So that's probably something we'd have to decide here um, by the middle of June, end of June, so we could get an application, end of June, so we could get an application put together to work with the rest of the event. It does work better if the board's unanimous because it looks kind of silly to cut three board members going the other four because <laughs> it needs to be a, a full court press if we're going to go into the to that extent yeah sure um, I kind of wonder I know I for one would feel even though I'm excited about this and we've got a lot of information from this team I think the team is the one that presented because they're the ones that can really respond to all of those questions sure I think the important thing is getting the information out there I hate to volunteer the team that I'm not part of, but if you can tell that, go for it. They're so proactive and with their grade level meetings that they have after school. They even sent out a survey. They didn't tell me about it beforehand, but they sent it out to all their teachers that were at the committee meeting. And just to see what they thought about the readiness program, the mandatory retention, I thought, oh my gosh, what kind of results are we going to get back? They were all for it. I don't know that any anybody was against it, correct? Shocked. That the word the around it is you got to have the rubric because it makes a difference with your job. It's just that simple. It, it really helps you to have everything in order. It's that simple. It's kind of deviating. Yeah, that's what you're Sorry, I missed that. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I, I did want to ask this before, though, because it was sort of presented as uh, if you raised a question. Um, the rubric is to all the children or only the ones you think need to be evaluated? We use it to simply evaluate the children that start to struggle or are struggling when they walk in our doors. And we have some that we know from the screening this past week that are going to struggle. So we use it in that indication. We're careful how we use it. No, it doesn't need to be applied to all children. We have many children who are very successful. But what we do is we apply it if we think we need to to certain students to see. We let their parents know up front. We let them know when we'll do it. They can come and ask us and visit with us if they have questions. But we do that selectively. We're very careful about that. I did apply it to all students from that second year parent-teacher conferences. And I felt like for some parents, it proved to them their child was ready. They didn't have, you know, they had a good score. They were doing well on all those sub skills. And I think it gave them some confidence about their child going on to first grade. And an important alignment piece is the report part. Because as we were developing the exit criteria, we were saying that we were speaking to parents about this all year long, and it just made sense that the report card that they received at the end of the year had the very same information on it. So you're going to see that alignment piece in first and second grade. Yeah, that's one thing I wanted to throw in. There's not, I mean, I don't want there to be a misconception that this rubric isn't for everyone, because it is for everyone. I mean, we're making sure that everybody's ready for first grade. But you can tell early on because right. of that alignment with the grade card and with the assessments who's struggling a little bit harder than you can begin having those conversations. So. But it's helpful to me because uh, I know in early on when we talk about common core, when we talk about implementing sort of innovative, which is very innovative programs, and we start collecting all this data, there's been discussion about data and what data they keep in on my child and what implications might it have. And then when we kicked in with this program, the mandatory promotion side of it, then all of a sudden it was like, okay, how are we using this 
data, it makes total sense for the professional teachers and the kind of crackerjack crew that we have here to use some discretion there and not use it as sort of an autocratic system, but more as what it sounds like it is, which is an evaluation and teaching tool. What I also really appreciate about this is how it developed. I mean, this happened at faculty meetings. Teachers were like, my kids are this far apart, you know, and I'm teaching a mile wide. And so that complaint was heard. The board acted with administration as a complete team with, with the teachers in the trenches. And this kind of was a, you know, I, I just think it was a good activity. And us listening, teachers talking, administrative support, people willing to form committees and work outside of class time. I mean, just a really a good list of awesome things happened for this product to be created. So uh, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back or administration, but I think it was pretty awesome how this developed. It's a great process. I just have a, a quick question. Maybe it's more clarification. And so you're recommending setting up a process for parents who wish to retain their, so is that something that the committee would do or that you're recommending that the administration does that? Or is it a collaboration? We're just what recommending that? it through, through the process. Uh, we do now have that process in place for the mandatory promotion fees. But I think it's kind of a sticking point. And I think everybody's comfortable with that now. So we're just asking them to recommend the residence programs. Is that what you were asking? Were you asking what this piece looks like? I guess I'm kind of asking what that means. Like. Okay, I thought that's what you were saying. Our beginning discussions have been, um, I mean, we kind of brainstormed several things. But you ladies want to touch on it? I feel like I'm talking a lot. <laughs> I'm excited about this. So I'm, <laughs> um, I mean, several things can happen, but if there's, take for instance, it was in place right now, and the parent comes in to me and says, I really want my child retained. Then we can have those conversations and then I suppose what I would do if it was in place right now is I would ask, you know, take it to Leanne. And, but um, one thing we've looked at is having like a, like a, a little panel made up of different uh, principals, the one from the building and maybe like two others that can go and present the case and say, hey, I've got one here. She's passed the rubric, but for this reason and this reason, parents are requesting this. We agree with the, the, re, the retention and promote it that way. But I don't know if that's been set. Is that kind of what we were? That's, that's kind of what we were. We're keeping discussing. it at the building level. We're keeping it at the building level. Yes. Don't bring it up here. No. Yeah. No. If they can't agree, mm -hmm. then we will have a discussion. But for the most part, I think they're going to agree. I think the big yeah. idea is that it becomes a team decision. It becomes something that they can look at with the principal, with the teacher, with the parent, and we may need to bring in another principal or another teacher to help get a good perspective. And really look at, again, the goal here is to make the best decision
little caveat is that it may change in the future, depending on what happens with the court case and decisions um, that come out of that hearings, hopefully the recent or the near future. Um, but until we have anything different, that's kind of what we're moving forward with. Um, and that's kind of how I'm going to start planning my budget over the next few weeks. So, great. I just wanted to give you one thing. Really, and I've been going around trying to tell the schools, the four schools, about just uh, sharing uh, the same information that the board received that KJ put together. But also, we, we've added stuff that um, I think it's just kind of interesting for our staff to Real quickly, I want to run through some of what we're sharing with them. And this is kind of a work in progress as, as other kind of topics or questions come up, we add to this. But this is the NAEP um, data from, from Kansas. NAEP is given the grades, National Assessment of Education Progress, given the grades 4, 8, and 12. Um, when we want to compare ourselves with other states, this is a good one to give or to look at because it's, it's required by the U.S. Department of Education, so it is given in all states. And um, where it falls down a little bit is that not all kids take it. it is, it's a random sample, but it's statistically controlled by the U.S. Department of Ed. So to give you a little idea, um, this is all kids, all scores. So in 2003, we were 10th out of 52 states. Now, that includes B.C. and, and uh, uh, Puerto Rico, so don't think I forgot my U.S. geography. Um, 2005, we were 10th, 2007, 7th, 2009, 11, 2011, 13. And again, th this is grades four and eight data. Um, if you look at our kids that qualify for free and reduced lunch, Kansas went seven, 10, seven, six, seven. Pretty amazing numbers. Well, we all know that in 2009, things kind of got tough across the country. For a while, we had stimulus dollars in our budget, um, and it's been a slow climb out of that. And, and really, a lot of states have started to reinvest in their public school systems, and Kansas really hasn't done that to a great extent. So if we look at the next two years, and we look at the numbers that we're seeing, they don't look as good as what Kansas have become accustomed to seeing. So in 2013, we were 18th, in 2015, we were 23rd. If you, if you just look at the, the single-digit numbers, 2003 and 2011, you see mostly single digit numbers. If you look in the last two columns, you see one single digit number. So, uh, as we talked about, um, we've cut about two and a half million dollars out of our budget over the last three years. That's been happening all across the state, and you're starting to see the effect of fewer resources um, on, our, on, on our results. Um, one of the things that you you know, we look at his teacher pay, and <coughs> the darker the blue, oops, back up. The, uh, the darker the blue, and I'm going watch, I'm going to do this and move it ahead. The darker the blue, the better the pay. So you can see Kansas uh, with our three neighboring states. Um, we, uh, Colorado, uh, Nebraska, and Missouri were behind and were tied with Oklahoma. When you look at our, uh, when you look at administrator pay, it's the same thing. Our three neighboring states um, pay better. When you look at the specific numbers, um, National Center for Education Statistics, Kansas ranked 12, 13, ranked 42nd. Bureau of Labor Statistics in 13, 14, ranked as 45th. 12, 13, and 13, 14, according to the National Education Association. Association were 38th and 39th. And when you think back to those NAEP scores and when you look at other measures, Kansas has typically been between 5th and 15th in terms of student achievement. But we're really not probably keeping up on this end of things with what, our doing, with what we're doing for our teachers. And, and uh, I get that the average person out there probably doesn't see that. But, you know, I didn't make these numbers up. These, these come out of come from these sources. Is this strictly dollars? No, this is this is strictly um, <coughs> dollars across all. Uh, it doesn't factor in cost of living. Um, but does it factor in packages too, like healthcare and things like that? Uh, I believe that is just average compensation. That doesn't include benefits. That's just salary. <coughs> One thing you're going to hear out there is that Kansas 
spend some plenty of money on education. We're spending a lot. We're just not getting it to the right places. Well, this is from KSB, and this is looking at all district expenditures 60 across the state. 61% goes directly to classrooms, teachers, supplies, that kind of stuff. 9.85 goes to operations and maintenance. In our district, we have 21 buildings. 18 of those are schools. So the vast majority of this money goes directly into schools. And what does it pay for? It pays to fix the roof when it leaks. It pays to replace the carpet. It pays custodians to keep the rooms clean. And, and as I've talked in every school I've been to, and I think, I've, I think Roy and I have two left, every school I've been to, the people in these meetings say, that makes a difference with our kids. That helps us in our classrooms, and we don't want you to stop doing that. School administration is 5.8%. The number one factor, school-based factor, that affects the quality of a kid's education is the classroom teacher. Number two is school leadership. Student services, counselors, nurses, librarians, those people would fall under. They're not in the classroom every day, so they, can't, they don't count down here. But again, every school says those people are important. They make a difference in what our kids, in what our kids do in class. Food service is almost 5%. And I joke, this one's fairly easy. We can just stop doing it. Every kid brings a sack lunch. But how many of our kids will come without a sack? And then what's going to happen with them? Transportation, 4%. Again, I kind of, this wasn't the a question on my test to be Dr. Carlin, but I'm, I'm almost 100% positive that if we don't get the kids to the classrooms, the teacher can't teach them. And, uh, and we transport over 40% of our kids, over 3,000 kids a day, uh, we transport. Some would be at school whether we transport them or not, but many will not. Instructional support, this is paras, curriculum, uh, people, instructional coaches, um, and uh, uh, other support services and uh, general administration or people in this building, special ed, business office, my office, um, and so when you look at, uh, you know, you keep hearing the dollars that affect classrooms, every one of those areas makes a difference in what goes on in our classrooms. Every one of those areas is in the classroom every day, but without these other pieces, our classrooms would not look like, like they do. Um, this is something you're going to hear. Kansas spends, Kansas is second or third in the country in state general fund spending on K-12 education. So here's Kansas. This is true. That's true. Kansas does that. Uh, most of you know I came from Wyoming. Any guesses where Wyoming is? Right down here, second to last. So if I was a parent and I was moving to Wyoming or Kansas and I chose to come to Kansas, I'd probably be pretty happy with my decision when I heard that we spend second or third in the country and our percent of state general fund spending is on K-12 education. But if we look at this a different way, this combines all of the state, local, and federal funding. Every dollar we get and divide by the number of kids we serve, Kansas spends $11,596 per pupil. That's $800 below the national average. Here's Kansas. This line is the national average. Here's Kansas. Can you say what the colors are? Uh, the uh, gray is, is uh, uh, local. local. The orange is state, and the blue is federal. Wyoming. Where's Wyoming? Wyoming is fifth. So as, as that mom or dad, that might change your feeling about that decision. The reason Wyoming can do this is they just don't put the money in their state general fund before they give it to schools. Those of you who were on the board uh, uh, two years ago remember the 20 mills of property taxes that were levied. Those stayed here. They came from the county clerk directly to KJ, and she put them in our bank. Two years ago, the state changed the rules, and we now send that money. The county clerk sends that money to the state, and then the state sends that money to us when they think we're ready for it. We still get the same amount of money, but it now goes to the state general fund first and then comes to us. But it, it doesn't change the amount of money we receive. Well, maybe that's only an accounting gimmick for some, but I've talked to the superintendents in some small communities like Mead and Hugoton, and those dollars 
used to go into their local banks, their bank on Main Street. Now those dollars go to Topeka. And in some of those small districts, when interest rates were a little better, they might make forty or fifty thousand dollars a year in interest, which would have paid for another teacher for them. Now that money is kept by the state. So uh, while it while it's true to say Kansas spends second or third most in state general fund spending on K-12, it's really misleading when you look at the dollars that we actually have to work with with kids. <coughs> you might also hear that Kansas spends more today on it on K-12 than we ever have. And folks, the numbers are astronomical. In, in 2009, Kansas spent $5.6 billion on schools. But we educated almost 450,000 kids. But that's a big number. That's a lot of money. In 2015, we are. We're going to spend just a little over $6 billion. So it is true that we're spending more now than we ever have. But if you adjust for inflation, just adjust for inflation. The red line is what we actually have and what, we've actually, what we actually spend. The, the green line is if we start in 2009 and we adjust for inflation, we're over $230 million behind where we should be as a state. The other thing is we're educating almost 15,000 more kids today than we did in 2009. And it costs money to educate every one of those kids. And in the past, we've been funded based on the number of kids we have. If you add, increase that funding, we're in the $300 million range behind. So while you hear we're spending more than we ever have, and that's true, not one of us would expect to run our household without accounting for the increase in the cost of a loaf of bread. The increase in the cost for an oil change when you take your car down to get it changed. A gallon of milk. Those things cost more than they did. And so do our supplies. And, and uh, you know, we, we want our employees to be able to keep up with the cost of living. So these are just some of the things just to share with you. Um, there, there is a, a lot of misinformation. Uh, uh, some things that are true but that are misleading. Some things that may not be true that end up being put out there. But, we really want to try to put accurate information out for people, and so Roy and I are working hard to do that. We're going to have a section of our website that will have some of this updated information to try to keep the keep accurate stuff out there. So, um, uh, questions? Bridge to the bar. <laughs> I just wanted to know you let you know your superintendent is doing something. <laughs> give you a list of all the dates. We'll approve August and on at our organizational meeting in July, but we do need to set the dates tonight for July. Um, and it's probably not a whole lot of fuss to argue unless you want to come to a board meeting on July 4th. Um, looking at where the, where the Mondays fall. And so I think what's proposed is the 11th or the 25th. Are there any comments on that? I move we approve um, July 11th and 25th as our meeting dates for 
lot of things to say because there's a lot of cool stuff going on this time of the year. Um, so I, you know, I almost need to mention any of it because I'll leave out, leave out a bunch of it. But uh, I'm just proud of our district. I'm proud of our kids and our staff. It's always shocking to see how many people are leaving. Uh, you know, parting is such sweet sorrow. But, you know, when they're particularly when they've been with the district for a long time. That work to get new t teachers in is, I, you know, I just want to encourage the team. I know they're working hard, and, and it's a challenge to get those positions filled. And, and so there's a there's a real anxiety there, um, even though I know that they're doing a great job. Um, the information we've been given is uh, concerning, and uh, and it is exciting to see the programs that are being implemented. On the Grow your own teachers. The uh, proposed incentive for uh, um, student teaching uh, to help that situation out, and then the uh, incentive in teachers, particularly from out of state, but anywhere that, that encourage someone to come to USD 457 and they're hired, that there's a there's an incentive there for our existing teachers. Um, there, there's just a lot going on and um, a lot of interest in saw a sample of that here tonight and, and our staff and, and so I'm, I'm pretty proud of USD 457. Oh, I just wanted to go through the numbers of how many kids we graduated this last weekend. It was 449 yeah. at the high school in that walked, neighborhood that actually walked and then how many of the alternatives? I think we had 51 that walked but probably Close to close, close to seventy, but maybe not quite 68, 69 total. Is that pushing a record? That would be a record. Yeah. Yes. We can celebrate that stuff. That's awesome. Huh? That's amazing. So good job, and I thought the the ceremony went really well. And there were a few parents I wish would have sipped it, but the kids did great. <laughs> Oh, and and the board members, I know that one of the board members had a move that I... I, didn't I know, know, can we see that again? No. no. <laughs> Come on, you guys, <laughs> board member. Um, no, I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I did have something I wanted to bring up, and I understand the time frame on the Rural Housing um, Initiative is... I did want to mention that, you know, as we are getting diminished funding from the state, we depend more and more on our local funding. And um, when we participate in these programs, we diminish the amount of money that we are going to receive locally for a period of time. And, and that's money that we really are dependent on. to make sure that um, I guess I my view on that is that these things are really starting to take away funding that we need at our core. They are cutting us to the quick and um, while I, I think it's really important to participate in improving things for the citizens of Garden City and to participate as a good Some level, and I don't know what that is in, in the future, we may have to, to draw back from being able to do that um, just because our own, the effectiveness of our own organization is starting to be something we need to consider um, a, a little more than, than our participation in.
but we can absorb it, but we can forego and, and still maintain the core um, things that we need to do as an organization for the students of Garden City. Because what we need to do is really basic to what is important to development of Garden City. Um, all of these other things aren't going to happen. We're not going to have great businesses and industry want to come here if, if they're looking at those same statistics that you're um, kind of showing tonight. Um, we want to be able to present a top-notch school district and a top-notch school system for, for all of the students. And, and that's really core to anybody coming here. So it's really important <coughs> that we, we look at these in the future very hard and very carefully something that we can participate in or if we really need to, to, to just draw back and try to maintain what we, what we have. I'd like to comment that that's uh, sobering. Well, it is, but so is that point of intimidation. It certainly is. Right. And, and therefore, I think it's, uh, it's very appropriate the way the staff district here has developed things like the, um, the culture, um, you know, if we're going to shoot for being an exceptional district, we'd like to be that way in all environments, and it's kind of nice to have that listed out there so that um, when we deliberate on our goals, how to change or modify them with the resources that we have, um, we can keep that in mind that we still want to be great. Gotta have some things to help us think through that process. 